how I wanted to start. Just die. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The images, they just won't go away. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Friday Night Live. And uh, tonight, we're going to take a, a suggestion from the listeners from last week, which was to talk about the jury pool. And uh, we have a lot of information. The researchers have been working all week. And we have a lot to cover on that. So let's see who all we have tonight. Is it showing for you guys? Because I still have video on available. Is it working for you guys? Yes. I'm going to refresh. I don't know if I'm supposed to. I, I can see a big exclamation point oh. on the screen. Oh. Okay. I had to mute it. It always The video feeds is, the audio yeah. is working. Yeah. I don't know about that. I got my volume down. Ah. All right. Let's say hi to a few people. Who's on with me? Sammy, you here? I'm here. And Lily. And Yeah, I am here. I'm just in the yeah. in the background. Gotcha. And She's in the back row. Yeah, I'm here. Always. Hey, sometimes the back row's where you want to sit. That's where we all sat on the case. Wild horses can keep me away. <laughs> all right. We see what you see already. Perfect. Thank you, Slayer. Uh, Jeannie, Jeannie, was it you that sub, uh, suggested that we talk about the jury? Hi, Jane. Good morning to you. Hey, Mary Mary, lots of love. Good to see you, Disco. I think it was Jeannie that had suggested us to talk about the jury. I'm just kind of waiting to see if she answers back. She may be off already. She said yeah. she'll be back. She's probably doing something, trying to hurry to get here or something. All right. No? Okay. Someone in the listening crowd, maybe it was Mary Mary. I'm not sure. But someone suggested that we um, look into the jury itself. And so the researchers this week have had their heads down at their desk. And not only are they doing their normal work on the mini ma'am, the daily reads and stuff, but they're also gathered some great information and source material on different aspects of the jury. So we'll be talking about things from Oh, how they pick jurors to how many are allowed um, and each individual juror as much as we can find out. Um, most of the juror names are still suppressed for their protection. We've had a couple jurors on their own come up. Um, yeah, yeah, Janie's got it right because one juror regretted leaving. Yeah, so we're just going to dig into it a little bit. Um, what BB, on, on the jury itself and the trial, what do you think is the most outstanding fact that you have have personally come across about the jury, I, the Avery trial, I, or Jassy trial, I, for that matter? Well, I have to say it would be the uh, part-time deputy sheriff, that Manitowoc deputy sheriff that was on the jury. And also the guy whose wife worked, got reinstated for, uh, at the Kirk, Kirk of Court's office while he was on the jury. And then Sammy has found one where a wife whose husband worked in the Kirk of Court's office also. Okay. Sammy, um, so you also were doing some researching. Hold on one minute. David Vinyl says... Looking at the jury, that's what Uncover Mother did. Ah, very good, very good. Yeah, I think it's worth looking into. Um, and a lot of the information that we have, uh, we've tried to remember to grab the source that we grabbed it from. So we'll be sharing links. I'll try to remember to put the links pasted in the live chat so you can click and read the full article. Some are newspapers, some are Reddit. Um, I know we get a little bit of heat because we seem to like Reddit. I like it because they show their work on Reddit a lot. 
it gives us and a, it makes it easier to be able to give credit to somebody who allowed you you know the information that you didn't have right absolutely now jane made mention i heard pagel visited too we absolutely have proof of that and the details of that um gamer girl says totally worth looking into absolutely good morning tony dr silkman's in that house woo, woo. oh yeah all right you guys so what we did i got home from work today i opened up powerpoint and we have i basically went through what the team has researched i grabbed it all and um put it all together in a powerpoint just kind of like in a cut and paste cut and paste um Ah, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that I said your name right. David, I have a hard time with names after reading the castle. There's times I'm like, what are they making these names up? <laughs> At least I straight up murdered the names, so you're better than me. But what we're talking about names real quick, I know it's completely off the subject, but what's funny is, you know, I have two sons, I've mentioned that before, that live with me still. So I have an adult son, but he's already grown up and has his own life. So the two that live with me, I got him each a kitten. And this is how night and day kids can be. I asked this one, what are you going to name your kitten? Well, I'm going to name this kitten of mine, Sir Wilhelm. And I'm like, what? And he's like, Sir Wilhelm. Well, I call it Willie because I can't do that. The other one, I'm like, what are you going to name your kid? Rick. I'm like, yeah. you're going to name your cat Rick. So we have Sir Wilhelm and Rick. And I thought, what unusual name, Wilhelm. Then I go to read the Casso, and there's the guy's name is in there is Wilhelm. And I'm like, they're making this up. They're watching my life, and they're just making stuff up or something. Oh, my God. It was so funny. Um, okay, guys. Um, so... Hi, Sheila. How are you? Let's grab the PowerPoint. So um, this is something that, um, Sammy, you were able to find, which is a blurry, blurred out version of the courtroom jury list. Now, Sammy, explain to me again. I mean, I know, I know, because I asked you, but explain to the listeners when you found this, um, what you went through and, and why they blurred it out and so forth. Well, first of all, um, when I, I read, it was an article, and they were discussing how some of the jurors had come forward saying, you know, there was unfair play, basically, that this needed a, re a redo. They needed a retrial. So somewhere in that article, I found they had this photo, and because they called every juror and asked for permission to be able to display this document. They couldn't get everyone's permission. Therefore, it was blurred out. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to look to see here real quick. Like there is at the bottom of that page. It's going to show um, on Milwaukee.com LLC. Okay. So they and that's there. how I found the article. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the things that I had found and I had shared with the researchers at the beginning of the week was a memo, a defendant's memo on examples of pre-judicial, pre-trial publicity that hurt the case so badly. So let me see. Um, so if you'll bear with me for a mi minute or two, what I'm going to do is... Let me grab this link, and this way, if you want to read with us, you can you can copy it. And now I'll go to the chat. Here we are. Okay, I've entered it for you guys. Um, I just want to hit a couple places on here. Um, by no means are we going to have time to completely go through this entire document. But it's a very good example of why Stephen didn't get a fair trial. So even in just the induct, you know, the introduction, um, this is the defendant's uh, morandum on examples of pre-judicial, pre-trial publicity. So Stephen Avery has assembled a sample of massive pre-trial publicity in this case, and submitted that to the court without objection from the state in the form of 24 DVDs of television coverage 
of the investigation into Teresa Halbach's disappearance and the prosecution and two bankers' boxes of photocop photocopies of newspaper articles, teleprompter scripts, radio broadcasts, um, and comment on the case from websites. This case has received saturation coverage in part because of his change of counsel from the Wisconsin Public Defender's Office to retain counsel and in part because the task would have been impossible. Mr. Avery made no effort to collect all material or all media coverage of the case. The earlier affidavit of Dean A. Strain outlines in overview the contents of the sample materials he did gather because even that mass of information remains daunting. The television television coverage alone apparently runs to more than 20 hours of back-to-back -back clips relating to this case. Avery now offers a sample of his samples. The discussion that follows is illustrative, not exhaustive, and Mr. Avery stands in the end on all of the evidence of pretrial publicity in the record. So what's being basically said is that the jury had been poisoned by the amount of media coverage that, um, and it was so extensive. When you look at that, 20 hours of back-to-back -back clips relating to this case. And then you look up here and you're talking um, two Bankers' boxes of photocopies of newspaper articles, teleprompter scripts, radio broadcasts, and comments from other websites. Um, examples was a reoccurring theme. The defense, the defense has submitted 24 DVDs of nothing but Avery clips, with at least one of the DVDs more than two hours long. Even that sample of television coverage stops in late April 2006 when expense became prohibitive and the cumulative effect of the publicity clear. And there is a gap between mid-November 2005 and March 2006, except for very few Milwaukee clips in January. So basically, the, the coverage, and this is something that you might want to take the time and read, um, the coverage was extensive. And I'd love to have my hands on those two boxes. Oh, I know, right? Yeah. Huh. Just saying. Okay. Yeah, no, I totally hear you. He's talking about Mr. Dassey's lawyer. I can't even call him a lawyer. We're talking about yeah. Lichensky. Yeah. Yeah, um, here's one. Next, the state conducted eight television new news conferences, at least all eight named Avery commented on inflammatory, inadmissible information and commented as well on evidence and evidentiary detail. Four came after the state charged Mr. Avery. This matter, the participation of the state, is promulgating adverse publicity is relevant in determining whether the trial court abused its discretion in not granting a venue change. Yeah, they can't really grant a... What's the point of granting a venue change when... Um, let's see, where is it? Oh, I wanted to share this picture with you guys. Um, the world is watching. I was wondering... How does everybody feel like doing a uh, hashtag the world is watching for a week or so? Let's get that out there and uh, make sure we keep the guys safe. So is this the one? Yeah, there's one on here. Let me grab it. Like I said, it was after work. So let's start off here, you guys, with this. Let's start off with how a jury is selected and how specifically this jury was selected, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Didn't mean to cough in your ear. 144 Manitowoc County residents were summoned January 29th to the county courthouse to fill out questionnaires to be potential jurors for the Stephen Avery trial. Now, I've taken this out of an actual article that happened at that time. The questions were written by Circuit Judge Patrick Willis who is presiding over the trial. A prosecutor, Avery's lawyers, and the judge 
began questioning members of that pool Monday. After Monday's questioning, nine members of the pool were selected as potential jurors. Once that number reaches 30, perhaps today or Wednesday, prosecutors and Avery's lawyers will each be able to remove seven potential jurors. That will leave 16 jurors to hear the case. Twelve jurors will be chosen to deliberate on verdicts and four will be designated as alternates. Now, something in my reading that I came across was that all 16 jurors in this case, um, it's led allegedly, I'll say this because like BB's going to get him. BB, I'll give you a minute to address this statement in just a second because I know you, you have an ace to play. <laughs> so, and I respect that. Uh, but let me just say, so the 16 jurors would not have technically known which one of them was going to be in the deliberation. So all 16 have to pay complete attention because they may be selected at the end to deliberate as a, as a, as a juror with weight in the vote counts. But what they're saying is four will be uh, designated, designated as alternatives and they may have to fulfill a juror's spot. So BB, do you think that's true? Do you think all 16? No, did? I, I assure you that those three that I brought up earlier knew that they were going to get picked. I, I assure you, the, especially the guy who works as a part-time uh, sheriff for the Manitowoc County Police. As a volunteer guy who's yeah. dad. Wasn't his yeah. father also on the force full-time or something? No, no the dad the, the, the dad is the, his son is something else too for Manitowoc also. But okay. he, the dad, is the one who was the juror and he, Carl, something with a W, um, okay. I don't have my thing in front of me. Here, I got it. Let Carl me Wardman. Yeah, him. Yeah, I, I assure you, he knew he was going to get picked. He had to be there deliberately. You, they knew he was a sheriff. Come on. Yeah, that I can guy. say oh. his name because he went to Wardman? interviews and did, you know, stuff with the newspaper reporters to just kind of boast, I guess. I don't know. It's what it sounded like. Well, and See, he his son is a supervisor. Jurors. His son worked as a MCSD, which is a Manitow Manitowoc County Sheriff Department supervisor and was a sergeant during the trial. Mm -hmm. And Daddy, who's yeah, the volunteer, volunteer one. Yeah. And, and somewhere there was a newspaper article. I didn't wind up getting that. Okay. Sorry. Um, but there was something about that his daddy wasn't like just like a once in a while volunteer, like he volunteered all the time. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then let me see. There was a mystery juror that stated it was a compromised verdict and that the jurors traded votes. And this juror was fearful for his own safety. So, in the book, Illusion of Justice, Inside Making a Murderer, we have Judge Willis also refused to remove a juror who revealed halfway through the trial that contrary to her sworn jury questionnaire, she really was acquainted with Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office, Detective Rumaker, and a frequent partner of two central figures in the Avery Evidence drama, James Leake and Colburn who were both at the scene when virtually every piece of incriminating evidence was found. She admitted she previously sat on a jury that rendered a civil verdict for Remaker of more than $100,000, which clearly indicated that the jury had judged his credibility favorable. Well, see, they're straight up stacking the jury pool. Yeah. They really I mean, are. there's no way this is an accident. This is they're straight up <laughs> stacking the jury pool. Yeah. yeah, this is no accident by any means. And I wanted to mention really, really quick, uh, you mentioned the anonymous juror, um, the articles that I read on this person who stated uh, they believe Avery was framed by the law enforcement and they cast a guilty vote because they feared for their personal safety 
back then. But right. is willing, if Avery does get a new trial, to oh. participate as a source. Mm. Mm. Very good. Now, BB, you were talking and, about... And these, these are just the people that we've been able to find out about. Because right. most of them names are all blacked out and you can't yeah. find out about. It. So these are just a handful of people. Now, what's in the rest of the pile? Well, with the gentleman you spoke of on the jury that had the wife that yeah, was reinstated, you got this little meme you saved for us. It says, Juror William A. Moore, wife Alice, was reinstated in the clerk of court's office just for the Avery trial. Conflict of interest. I wish I had a big stamp. I could be like, stamp. Yep. <laughs> um, I thought this was interesting. Zoe brought this up. Um, it's like mm, two in the morning there. <laughs> Maybe yeah. three she or something. Asleep. Yeah, she sound asleep. But Zoe brought this up, and I want to thank her for doing that. This was um, a little statement that on 11 1905, Teresa Hobbock's funeral was broadcast live. It was heart rendering material, obviously inappropriate for consideration by the jury veneer. The court presumably would not seat a juror who knew Ms. Hobbock or a family well enough to attend her funeral. By television, though, now thousands had the experience of attending the funeral. Oh, and you can still find that online, by the way. Right. The, the funeral. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So even I've seen it. So I went and um, grabbed a couple of links out of Discord that out of the lab that the researchers had dropped us. One of them was this one. It's talking about um, Stephen Avery cops, which they believe jury tampered. So here's how, now I grabbed the link, I'm going to highlight it and I'm going to paste it because this is an incredible article. We would end up doing the whole live on this article if we had the time, but we don't. Um, so I'm going to sh share this link so that you have it yourself to be able to look up what we're reading. Um, so let me go back and grab this little tidbit. Where am I? There we go. So many windows. Okay. So I think this one is four, four boards long. So make it a murder. Chief investigators mingled with Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey's juries during their trials. Um, even going up to a hotel, juror's hotel room, and showing up at a private dinner at a restaurant. Okay, so an exclusive interview, Avery juror Richard Malier reveals that the sheriff in charge of Teresa Halbach's murder investigation turned up unannounced at a juror's private dinner to give them permission to drink alcohol. Um, whoops. According to what Jerry Butin told me after, if he'd known that Pagel was in my hotel room, he would have called a mistrial. The only person who had business to be in my hotel room is the bailiff. And he goes on, it, the story goes on to say, the reporter says, Malir was allowed home and was discharged from the jury. So there was this accident that took place when he called home. Um, and it was his daughter. So they, they said, yeah, you can go. But Avery's former lawyer, Buting, says that the two incidences were enough to cause a mistrial. There was no reason for Pagel to show up, quoted Buting. Quote, also, at the time, the explanation was that Pagel came by just to say, yes, the jurors can have a drink as long as they are, aren't deliberating. He goes on to say he shouldn't have done it. Um, he could have just sent a message, and there's no reason for him to come into Malaire's room. He says, the reason you keep them completely separate from people involved in the investigation is undue influence on the jury, spoken or unspoken. And there's grounds for a mistrial here. So um, he goes on to say, judges aren't even meant to have contact with them. So what the heck is this? Um, he may say there was no influence, but who knows? This isn't the only strange case of the police interference with the jury deliberations. Deputy Sheriff Mila Prang and Detective Dave Remaker were both in charge of ensuring no one could interfere with Avery's nephew and um, co-accused Brendan Dassey's jury. 
yet praying aloud her husband to deliver them pizza had been served drinks for three and a half hours from 9 and 9 p.m till 12 30 a.m according to the police report in the incident this was because there were quote no waitresses around Prang and Remeter were reprimanded by bosses with Remeter given a warning and Prang a one-day suspension. So here's the paperwork to back that up. And um, I'm going to grab this. I think I did share this already, but I'm going to post it one more time for you guys. And we'll catch some, some thoughts on this from the crowd. So let's go listen, see what has been said. <laughs> Slayer, you crack me up. Slayer says Kaczynski could not lie straight in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Janie will be back. She's eating breakfast. What did Mary Mary say? Oh, she picked BD and uh, ST as her as her pick picked people. Um, uh, Dr. Silkman says jury pool was already contaminated. How can you have an impartial jury? It's impossible. True that. Very true. Yes, Mary Mary. That was the one who left because his daughter was injured in a car accident. Um, well, he tells it slightly different. Okay. You I, want to share? Yeah. He tells it that they let him know that his daughter was in an accident and that she was severely hurt and taken to the hospital and that he was to go, that they had already got it approved for him to leave and that they had a replacement for him and that he could go to be with his family. And come huh. to find they, out, it was just a bump. A minor was an car even, accident. They wanted he, him off because he, yeah, he was the he, one that was thinking he was not guilty. He had the first original Steve Avery support group page. On Facebook. Yeah, he, he, he really regrets how that went. He came out early and uh, as soon as Making a Murderer came out, he started a support group right away and he has the first one. He had the first one from Facebook. So Sandra stated, um, Sandra Walters, she says, how could anyone with law enforcement be chosen on the jury? Selection is supposedly random. What a coincidence. Mary Mary says, Hallbox need to start talking. You got that right, Mary. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. Janie says, I think the whole thing was definitely rigged. And she says, he's also said he wished to, he hadn't left and said before he left, seven of them believed he was innocent. Ah, oh, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, okay, let's go back over. Okay, BB um, or Sammy or Lily, any of you want to comment on the Steve Rimmaker thing where him and this um, <laughs> prank? <laughs> they could get their own pizza out of the box. They can open their own drinks. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just more to be collusion. Was dropped off. What do you think? What do you think could have happened in three and a half hours? <laughs> We're going to get these bastards now, aren't we? Right? We're going to get this right, aren't we? You don't want to be responsible for letting for this murderer, murderer uh, rapist, and murderer. What do you think people uh, are going to think of you out there? And this coming them. from a man who probably had a gun on his side too, in the room with you. Good point. So here you got a guy, law enforcement. Well, actually, it's his. It's it's the partner's husband. It doesn't say the husband was authority. All right. Well, maybe not. So maybe but... he didn't. Maybe they just sent him in. Let's just go with that. Just a normal Joe walks in with pizza and soda. What do you think was said, Sammy? Do you know what, what I could do to somebody? Uh, in let me tell three you hours? what. It doesn't, you don't have to say it in so many words, just uh, allowing someone else to uh, be aware of the fact that you are either connected or related somehow to law enforcement, and you basically all have this in the bag, and this is how it's going to go, 
and you, it's, you leave it at that, it's intimidating. Yeah, to intimidate. There's been a study that you can convince somebody that didn't do something, that they committed a, a small crime in three and a half hours' time. Right. Well, rest assured, there was enough known about each and every juror, and it looks like a good portion of them were already basically tied into law enforcement, however you want to put it. So they pretty much had this licked. Right. I don't know. It's just the way I feel about it. I, I honestly think that um, even with the... Uh, even if we wouldn't have had anybody wrong on the jury that we shouldn't have had, I still think the fact that Kratz told the lies that he told to the jury, they would have probably bought it. Yeah. He's quite the storyteller, that one. Mm -hmm. Indeed. In fact, hold on a minute. <coughs> Let me see if I can grab this. Yeah. Okay. Talking about Kratz. Let's go over this, you guys. Dean Strain made the comment Friday. Now, keep in mind, you guys, this is stuff that was archived. So it's talking as though the trial hasn't happened yet. Okay. Dean Strain made the comment Friday during um, an appearance before about 110 fellow lawyers at the Wisconsin Association of Justice Spring Seminar at the Radisson Hotel and Conference Center. Strain was joined by Walt Kelly, an attorney who represented Avery in his $36 million wrongful conviction lawsuit against Manitowoc County, stemming from the 1985 rape along Lake Michigan near Two Rivers. Strain's explanation on the change of venue issue answers one of the most perplexing questions on the minds of people who have been following Making a Murder, the 10-part Netflix doc series that focuses on Avery's trial and conviction in the murder of the Hobbock in Manitowoc County. Hopes of moving the trial to an outside county were dashed when Kratz, at a press conference, detailed grisly allegations against Avery that were reported in every media market in Wisconsin. Strange says, Strange said, the details later debunked were from statements to the police from Avery's teenage nephew. Kratz presented a compelling, graphic, gruesome admission of guilt, laying out a confession that a 16-year-old had given implicating his uncle. Strain said there was not one of the 71 other counties in Wisconsin that we could have gone to get an impartial jury. It was pointless to try to go to another county to get a jury. Instead of seeking a jury from another county, now, you guys listen to this really cautiously. Strain and co-counsel Jerry Buting were allowed to try the case in Calumet County. Keep in mind, Calumet is where the victim is from. So the murdered, alleged murdered victims from Calumet County. Why on earth, you guys, would you want to go to the hometown of the victim where everybody's going to be like, oh, yeah, that's from our hometown. No, right. that makes no sense to me. Okay, let's continue. Before a jury of Manitowoc County residents, Strain said the lawyers hope. That would keep bailiffs and other Manitowoc County personnel from having contact with jurors. Sorry, it didn't. And that their case might be aided by jurors who were familiar with the Sheriff's Department long dislike of Avery. Please. Mm -mm. I can't see how, you know, okay, if this person was murdered in your hometown, you would hear about it. You would know about it. You would have an opinion. It would be too close at home. So would you want, I mean, if you wanted to give the suspect a true fair trial, why would you try, why would you try them in the hometown of the victim? I, I see a huge problem with that. Does anybody else see what I'm saying or feel the way I do? Well, yeah, and considering the fact that uh, the funeral was televised, 
you know, there was an awful lot of, of, they were doing an awful lot of manipulating and then to pick, to have it there and then to pick majority of people from there. (laughs) Yeah. It's stacked against them. The Mm -hmm. whole thing. Uh, Mary, Mary says her son was on a jury uh, had to serve on a jury and had to go to another town to do it. Right. So it may, like Emma saying, Emma Jenkins says, familiar with the victim too. It just it muddies the water. Paula, I put you an invite um, right there, but just so you guys know, there's this thing called description of the video. You guys can click that. And in that, I always give you a rundown of what we're talking about. It talks about the daily read. And then it also gives you a list of links that you can choose from, which is the Castle Report. You can get from any of our videos, as well as you can check out our Steve Avery Library. You can also join us on Discord with that link. You can follow us on Twitter. We do have Instagram. I'll be honest, I don't understand Instagram that great, so I rarely use it, but I am on there. If anyone Um, knows Instagram really well, they can help walk her through it. Yeah, Ah. and then if you want to show your support to the research, there's a donation area there, as well as my personal email is on there. So that's the Rubber Ducky 2005. Anytime you guys find a tip or a hint or you want to make comments, feel free to email me in any way that you like. Um, you can just they also say, can hey, in the library. Or... Yep. They yep. also can in the library. True, true. Drop oh, you're welcome, tip. Paula. Um, Gamer Girl says, I served on a jury and it was a different town, one bus ride away. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. So we went over jury selection here. Um, <clears throat> it says, the jury of six women and six men delivered the ruling after more than 21 hours of deliberations over three days, bringing an end. I'm hearing somebody talk, BB. Yeah. Um, Where were we? Deliberations over three days, bringing an end to a court case that had drawn statewide attention. I would even venture a little bit further than statewide. The verdict was read at about 6 p.m. Sunday, March 18, 2007, in a packed, emotionally charged courtroom in the Calumet County community of Chilton. Oh, Lord, right in her hometown. That's killing me. Avery gently lowered his chin and shook his head. According yeah. to the story published in the Post Crescent, his conviction was the watershed moment in one in the one of Wisconsin's most notorious criminal cases. But it didn't end there. A Netflix documentary that hit the airwaves nearly nine years later has reignited interest and has taken the story worldwide. Um, this is where Kratz, we're going to go over this a little bit. Um, we'll come back to it. I'm just going to check the, the wall here. Um, Emma says the whole jury either knew the family or knew someone who did. Stephen was never going to get a fair jury without the com- uh, conference with the conference that Kratz did. Truth. Not a chance. Um, Dr. Well, Stephen, and Teresa, Teresa yeah. uh, was a basketball coach for that school. So how many parents, grandparents, whatever, had oh. kids at that school that were on basketball with them? Yeah, good yeah. gracious. You know, and the Halbach name is not something that that community had never heard of either. No, they had a big dairy farm. Well, and I bet they're part of 4-H and everything else in yeah. the community. So, you know. It, well, uh, now, on the document that um, Zoe shared, um, it gave their locations, like their hometown. Mm-hmm. And um, there are six or eight that are Manitowoc and, like, three that are Two Rivers. Um, people that would be... In the area. Familiar, yes. Yeah. Whether it be they're familiar with the family, familiar with the story. Familiar with the name, the farm, the, you know. 
driving past the farm. Oh, yeah, there's that Holland box play. Yeah. And, you know, we have the opportunity to, at that time, to really keep these people from having this kind of knowledge. Because all that was being said on the news that we were seeing before Kratz did his little song and dance was that 25-year-old freelance photographer was last seen at the Avery property. And it really didn't say much more than that, that she was there to photograph a van. She was there five minutes. That well, was basically it. There that was, was a sign. There was quite a gap in the publicity from mid-November to the beginning of March because they weren't finding any evidence about Avery or Dassey. Yeah, there was yeah. nothing to really report, right? As really? soon as they started fabricating, they were on the air all the time. Well... Tony says the bones were crucial in this case. Eisenberg refused to commit on the pelvic bones in the gravel pit. This was done deliberately. Jury had no idea. Um, Gamer Girl says Sweaty Sweat did a darn good job poisoning the jury pool. You nailed it, Gamer. We're gonna we're gonna be jumping on um, one of the links that one of the researchers found that I found to be really good read. I want to share that with you guys in a minute. Um, and then Mary Mary says they are big now in their job, Hallbox. Yeah, they were yeah. very well known. And um, well, they're even more well known now, but they were very true. well known even back then. They were, a they big, had a very big dairy farm, and you know, that brings in a lot of money to the town, and people know, you know. Okay, guys, let's go back over to this little read. This is um, from Post Crescent. And let me grab the link, and we'll put it right in the um, chat for you guys. Hold on just a Jeff. If I get uh, one window open out of a million, here we go. Okay, yeah, you guys. Yes, interfering with a jury is a crime. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Welcome, Linda. Oh, I totally understand. They do that to me all the time. They got me going to work real early in the morning tomorrow. I hear you. Mary Mary says, I know, Jane, I would have had a breakdown if I was her mom. Oh, I know. Oof, after things KK said, yeah. Okay, you guys, let's go to that uh, that link. So Steve Avery's attorney. Now, keep in mind, I've just grabbed this little part of a large document. This part pretty much did a nutshell for me what we needed to talk about. Um, it's a quote, and it says, in order to win Mr. Avery's conviction and exclude everyone else as the perpetrator, the state had to convince the jury that Mr. Avery alone was connected to the crime scene. Attorneys Catherine Zellner and Stephen Richards wrote in a motion filed Monday in circuit court. Now, this wasn't like this past Monday. This is an older article. Then they go on to say, to establish a crime scene linked only to Mr. Avery, the state created a narrative that Teresa Halbach was murdered in Mr. Avery's garage and burned in his burn pit. Prosecutors presented, quote, false forensic story to jurors by claiming that the bones found in the Manitowoc gravel pit weren't human. Now, Dr. Silkman has cut a new video that's going to be coming out on Monday night that's going to go into huge detail about these bones, and they are the key to this case. So don't miss that video. Um, you will be so happy that you watched it. It's, it's, it's going to be in two parts, but we're going to release both parts at the same time. I just broke it into two parts, so they're a half hour each for him, and that way... Um, for you guys, it'd be a little easier if you do need to take a break. Um, but they go on to say that only to implicitly acknowledge that the bones were Hallbox by returning them to her family years later. And then more of the quote, the admissions of the state, the Miss Hallbox bones were in the gravel pit, change the scene of the crime to a location which is contrary to all representations made 
to the jury by former Calumet County District Attorney Kenneth Kratz. To obtain Mr. Avery's conviction, they wrote, also arguing, that it is also undermines confidence in the verdict against him. And yeah, confidence in the verdict. Um, you know, we we walk away hoping that our judicial system has kicked out um, the honest view without any interference of each individual member of the jury. However, in this case, they were fed absolute lies. It was kind of like if we would have taken today and sat down, um, let's say take a bunch of fifth graders, sit them all in, in chairs, and then as adults with them not having any understanding of what we're talking about, because at the time DNA was new. I mean, they felt that you know, even scientists were struggling to understand its full potential. And so a lot of the layman people like myself were like, DNA, don't know nothing, you know. Um, so whatever was told to them at that point, they were trusting. They were understanding in their belief system as a juror that what they were being told obviously had to be the truth. Or why would he be able to stand up there and say all this? But that's not the truth, was it? We now know that when you look at the great pools of female blood in the RAV that King Kratz went on the nightly news, quote unquote, yeah. great yeah. pools of female blood, where he lies, not once, not twice, he consistently lied in this case. You if know how many times I went looking just to check and see where did I miss it? The pools of blood? <laughs> and there's none. Well, They're I'm in Kratz's imagination. <laughs> I distinctly recall when Kratz was telling his whole scenario, and we were sitting at our supper table, and our mouths are wide open. Because the story was unlike anything we'd ever heard on the news. It was so graphic and so horrific that you didn't even want to eat your supper. You were like, uh. But what I remembered the most was he was rambling on and he was telling the story and it was all rolling out of his mouth like, you know, poop. When um, out of the crowd, a bigger voice, and I, I want to get this because if you guys, if any of us can find this interview, we could replay this a couple times and show now with hindsight how clearly Kratz lied because one of the reporters yells out without being called so he was calling people's name up oh, you you know at a press release this reporter yelled out and he was like where's the po where's the blood and Kratz ignored him and took a different question and the guy continued where's the big where's the big amount of blood and Kratz, finally, he just kind of brushed it off. And he said, uh, in the RAV. And then he went on about his business to answer another question. The guy said, where in the vehicle? And Kratz had to stop because he, he realized he was risking uncovering himself. He didn't address this. So he turned and he said, and I to this day believe that at this first moment, Jerry Pogel was like, oh, crap. Now we've got to come up with a pool of blood, Kratz, because this is how it was. Kratz turned. He said, oh, uh, yeah, um, pool of blood uh, under the seat. Yeah, un uh, under the seat in the, in the vehicle. He was he was reaching. He didn't know where to say the blood was. You could tell. Uh, uh, yeah, big pool of blood. And, and they were like, oh. Well, even at that moment, I remember thinking, oh, holy cow. It wasn't till nine years later after maybe even ten. Nine years later, I watched Making a Murderer. Then there's, you know, six to eight months of digging in well past ma'am, like we are now, that I discovered that was a lie. So how do you think the jury felt? Ugh, it's just unbelievable the amount of lies that has been told in this case. That they're allowed to get away with telling. If we lie to them, we go to jail. If they lie to us, tip to court. it's just another Absolutely. day. The hate for Kratz in this room, I, I guarantee you, Gloria, is probably substantial. <laughs> they, they need to start holding these people accountable and punishing them. I just heard that um, district attorney from 
the new Netflix one, they now they see us or something about the Central Park Five. Uh, she's in a bunch of heat for storytelling and lying and 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 stuff in that case. Jeez. Yes. Um, let's see here. Slayer wrote, I saw a Texan DA say that he could never have imagined a DA give the press conference that KK gave before he saw it with his own eyes. And then um, Dr. Silkman wrote, judge gave too much leeway to the state. And Sandra wrote, so they weren't human bones? Oh, yes, they were human, Sandra. They were very much human. But um, Gloria says, <laughs> I'm going to back up. Scott said, Scott Brick Bricker says, the pool of blood flakes. <laughs> yeah, you guys remember, there are actual blood flakes that are laying on top of the carpet in the rafts. So uh, apparently the person's blood was um, not absorbed by anything. And so it just dried and flaked. Yeah. Gloria said, and I'm not even going to try your last name, love. Whew. That's some good uh, scarch guarding there. Yeah. I'm from Wisconsin, and I remember that press conference, I Hate Kratz. Do you remember that, Gloria, where he was doing that, where he was leaning? The guy was, like, almost screaming that out, and uh, Kratz was trying to avoid it, trying to avoid it. And finally, he just made it sound like, yeah, nothing, you know. Oh, just in, just uh, under the seat, under the seat, yeah, in the back, in the back, in the back seat. Okay, next, next. And he wanted to move on real quick. It was just disgusting. Um. Yep, Gloria says, same with me, RD. If it wasn't for ma'am, we would not know what really happened. Absolutely true. Emma says, lies officially backed. Yep. Um, Sandra stated, Gloria, was Avery known in Wisconsin media before murder? Yes. So, I actually didn't know anything about the Hobbock murder because it had not happened. Um, I found out because he was released from Stanley Prison, which isn't that far from where I live. Now, I want to back up a little further. Before Stephen Avery, when they decided to build the prison, we were like, uh, that basically means if somebody escapes the prison, they, they, they're going to, we're going to be their first target if they're rapists and murderers. So we get to vote on this, right? And we did. We voted. And we did, um, the vote came out that we wanted the prison. Now, of course, I was one that didn't. But anyway, we got the prison. It was a newer prison, honestly. And so that alone kept the very local people in our area very aware of what was going on. We weren't happy about the prison being there. It's so strange when you go to Shopco and you look on your left and there's a big prison. You're like, oh, yeah, that used to be a cornfield. And so that was already in the, you know, our eyes. And then when the fact was that Stephen Avery was exonerated and he was being released, they made big news about this in the local area. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger because what happened is that Stephen Avery had been wrongfully convicted in 1985, was exonerated. But then not only did they find out that he was innocent, they found out that the local authorities in Manitowoc County had knowingly hidden um, information that may have freed Avery nine years earlier. So the court case became a civil suit when the state of Wisconsin, Peg Lockenschlocker said, nope, we didn't do anything wrong. Manitowoc didn't do anything wrong. Nobody did anything wrong, Steve. You're going to get the normal 25000 Even if they knew whatever they knew, it doesn't matter. Here's 25000 Go on your way. And they didn't pay that out right away. It took very, very long time to get that. And that's how Steve bought his truck, his uh, F, what was it, an F-350, I think. But... What was interesting is, as the state of Wisconsin denied doing any wrongdoing of even the county, Steve was able to, to enlist the Innocence Project and other people to back him. And so the money went from 25000 into a huge amount of money. So we started seeing things like one5 Four come in front of the screen on the DV and in the newspaper clippings. And then it went to um, 
I think it went to like 8 million at one time and then it jumped up even higher. Finally got to 18 million and it was the talk of Wisconsin. We were like $18 million. And Steve kept saying in front of all the public people, it's not about the money. It's about them realizing and taking accountability for doing something wrong. That's the main thing. Yet Wisconsin refused. And so it got doubled. And it was supposed to be for $2 million for every year that Stephen Avery served wrongfully convicted. So we were very aware of Stephen. In fact, I don't know about you, but there's others that were there, BB, you were around that time. <coughs> when we were kind of thinking, boy, you're getting kind of greedy, Stephen, on this $36 million. I hope I hope everything works out for you. It got to be a little bit nerve-wracking. Yeah, I remember going, can he actually get that kind of money for that? Right, right, right. Okay, let's take some crowd questions here. Um, let me see. Do, 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 do. I want to back up so that we get this. Okay. Gloria says, um, same with me, RD. If it wasn't for ma'am, yep, I read that one. Okay. Uh, Slayer Rock says she was murdered in the trailer, but held onto her blood for a short visit to her car. Okay. <laughs> oh, you could be a comedian, Slayer. Um, Tony <laughs> writes, jury was manipulated and deceived to bones and DNA. Yep. Emma writes, Stephen has magic blood and DNA. And don't forget, we always have the magic key. Gloria. Well, isn't that the truth? <laughs> at Sandra Walters. Okay, right before she disappeared, he was on the news every day with his, his exoneration. True that. Okay, Sandra says, I was really impressed with how well they cleaned out the blood in the garage, yet were able to leave all the other dust and mess. Isn't that incredible, you guys? I don't know how they pulled that little trick off. You know, left all the dust and stuff, but they got all the DNA out. Magic fingers. Oh, that's right. Not only do we have a magic key, but we have a magic wrap because it can magically appear out of thin air and it magically changes colors. And it magically unlocks itself. Unlocks itself. It's a locking door. Well, they should have just named it Christina. Right. Or Christine, whatever that movie was by. Uh, who was that by anyway? Stephen King? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> Uh, Slayer Aladdin has magic carpet cleaner. Okay. <laughs> Emma says, Kratz gets off on describing scenes. His book described the salvage yard as full of the skeletal remains of the cars. Yeah. Gloria says, I remember thinking that guy who was exonerated. Now they're saying he killed someone, huh? Yeah. Mary Mary, if you're right in your head, them blood marks have been put on by cotton. Yeah. I don't know that. I agree, Mary. I think that it was applied. Sherry Big Hair Colhane has a lot of explaining to do. Yeah. Well, and Emma, not only did Colhane have the worst record for mistakes, what kills me the most is it wasn't that Colhane. Not only did she she find, you know, testify in 1985 that she had identified the hair as being Stevens, which was wrong, and sent him away. Um, now, in 2002, it wasn't like Colhane's like, hey, let's go ahead and retest that, and I want to I wanna turn this, this game around. No, 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 no. Colhane, her hand was forced. She had no choice. And it wasn't her own interpretation of the evidence any longer. It was now a machine that she could not change the results on. So Colhane herself did not exonerate Stephen. The machine exonerated So I agree with that. And made her look bad. And at made the same her time. terribly bad. Yeah. Talk about a conflict of interest. Well, I think you're right about the blind testing. Yeah, I still to this day think that. I really feel like um, the crime... Well, both sides. They shouldn't testing. even know if it's suspected to be the victim or... 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think at times, like twice a year, they should run a fake test as a standard. Randomly. That it should always come back as victim A or it should always come back as suspect B. B. And then they submit that test randomly throughout the year, knowing that it's it's a uh, standard test to see if the forensic techs can match those results, knowing that it's a guarantee that this is the individual and it is a match or it isn't a match. Just a protocol to follow through um, and not know, never know any, like you said, blind test all the way. Well, Slayer, I think um, a lot of this, all what we're doing is we're trying to help paint this picture of what was happening around, you know, the the whole influence that there was on this jury. Absolutely. And answer questions in the crowd. So, um The main thing, you guys, with the jury is not only do we see that the jury is mixed with people that have a conflict of interest, we then see Remaker and others having um, contact with the jurors. The jurors later are explaining that some of them that they felt intimidated and feared for their their own safety in their life. Um, We have a potential juror that would have been able to change things in the sense that when he when he left because he thought his daughter was in mortal danger, um, we had people that thought that Stephen was not guilty. And he was also one of those too. And then you had some that were undecided, so it was a split jury. And so we've got jury tampering, basically, in my opinion. Um, we've definitely got... Um, jurors that shouldn't be on there that have a conflict of interest and then we have what was told to the jury what lies they were told and this entire case was based on what the jury knew what they accepted to be truth what their perception now i'm quoting Kratz, yep, Kratz, yep. their perception was it had nothing to do with the evidence it had nothing to do with stephen or with Brendan, it had to do with the perception of the jury. And that's why when when we talk about things like the gentleman's agreement, we get infuri- the lab. Yeah. infuriated. Because let me tell you something. If we're just going to simply, hey, let's just agree this is the victim here. We don't need any medical records, right? Would Selner agree to that? No. Heck no. Mm -hmm. never she would have said you get your ducks in a row you get me some medical report that shows me that's who the victim is but that's not what we have in this case so before the jury even is completely selected they've already decided that they're going to have a gentleman's agreement and not even question the victim's original identity they're just going to say well yep we're going to accept that that's a pap smear from Teresa. We're going to we're going to keep it real quiet where it came from. You know what? Let's not call it a pap smear. Let's call it an intimate sample. And let's not show any paperwork or chain of command of where that came from or how we got it. None. And why is that? Why is that? Because they're hiding something. Oh yeah. Well, nobody, nobody, nobody really represented. Stephen properly, period. No, or or Brendan. No. Mm-mm. And they so this big fabricated story was put out there to the jury and no one told them not to listen. When you're in a jury and you're sitting doing jury duty, there's going to be times where something's going to be said or even brought up <clears throat> that you're going to be thinking about while they're talking about it. And then there's an objection and then it's stricken from the record. And that means you have to forget about it. Yeah. How do you forget about it? Yeah. And so there's an awful lot of manipulation (coughs) and hearsay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is what they were given to work with and not to mention a fair fraction of the people that convicted him 
were related to people that were had their hands in law enforcement. I mean, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, I have a grandson who's a cop or whatever, and you're doing jury duty. But these people were directly related to people involved that should not have been on that jury. I always say, you know, if you're suing the hospital, even if the doctor didn't know and you had a heart attack right there in the emergency room and needed open heart surgery, even if the doctor didn't know that you had the lawsuit with the place, you really don't want him operating on you. Because there's a conflict of interest naturally. A conflict of interest means basically that you have a vested, you are invested in the outcome. You, you have an investment in it going one way, your way. We have that in this situation, even with the jury. We have it with the judge. Look at, with Brendan's judge, Judge Fox. Who was he? Well, he was Brendan's stepdad's family lawyer. I mean, conflict of interest seems to be a mute point when it comes to Wisconsin. And I don't get that. Do they not understand that? That's like Colburn with this lawsuit. Okay. Colburn, Andrew Colburn, if you're listening, I have something to explain to you. Because apparently you missed third grade at this point. So I'm going to make this abundantly clear, just amply clear to you. If your county is being sued and you are directly depositioned, you put in your deposition, you will be considered to look guilty if your name appears in the case, even if you do nothing wrong. You know why? Suspicion. That's what conflict of interest is. It's a natural way that you would need to be able to have an outcome that benefits you. You can say, well, I did my job professionally. I did it right. doesn't matter. You made a mistake when you chose to go against the grain, to swim up the river against the tide and ignore a conflict of interest. You automatically chose your own problems. You knew you were going to get looking guilty. You work for the county that just got done screwing him over in 1985. Well, and he found all the key pieces of stuff he was in on. Yeah, between Lincoln Colburn? The key, literally. Yeah. Yeah. I always say... Player Rock says they had the the opportunity to get the intimate sample from Common Botwell's apartment. Well, they did an autopsy on her. That's how they found out that she had overdosed. So they could have got anything they needed right from the autopsy. That's right. Yeah, And I've heard from a number of people um, that, you know, if when they were in Carmen's place, if they collected all the sample of, of stuff to take with her, they could have reintroduced that in the setup as Teresa Hallbach's items. So when Carmen went to the ER in life-saving measures or whatever, how do we know that they didn't? take the samples that they needed and then introduce it as an intimate sample. In this case, we don't, you know why it could have been anybody's pap smear. It could have been anybody's stuff. And Sherry Colhane was playing fast and loose with everything at the lab. Fast and loose. Yeah. I still, at this point, you guys, I never would have thought I would say this, but I'm going to just come out and say it. There is no way Colhane accidentally, in my personal opinion, coughed on any bullet. I think when nobody was looking, she was like, okay, I need to get some Hallbach DNA on this because Fassbender said, you know, put her in the garage or the house. And I've already figured out the key thing, but I got to figure out this bullet. Um, I know what I'll do. I've got two fragments. I know I'll put the DNA on this part. But I'm going to suck on the bullet first, get my saliva all over it so they can't retest it. That way, they'll never know what kind of DNA is on the bullet. But lo and behold, times have changed, Sherry. And now we've got Zellner with experts that can put it under a very high-powered microscope. And that basically shows you're full of crap. 
Sherry Colhane, my personal opinion as rubber ducky is you lied. You perjured yourself, in my opinion, on the stand. And um, I think that you intentionally switched and the swaps over. I think when it came to the Grand Am, Sherry Colhane went over and she took the sample out like she's supposed to. And then she looked her little sideways, sideways look that she likes to do. We all know that sideways look. She did that and there was nobody around. So she just leaned over and marked it into the rab and was like, there we go. Now I'll put her in the, put him in the car. And she does lie. She has the highest air rate. So you want to you wanna talk about lying. You know, I looked at everything that I could that we've been finding about the jurors, how they were chosen. You know, they were all asked questions. Um, and some of them just knew the right answers to give, you know, to keep from being booted off. You know, one of the people that we did name, who's already come out on their own, um, he was asked, could the cops lie under oath? That was his question he was given. And he said, yeah, because they could get away with it. Right. So what do you think happened? He ended up staying up there because he was not, this was, this was the one way they could say, oh, well, that, that juror wasn't, you know, we didn't influence them. Well, Scott Bricker says, I still have a hard time believing that Stephen's lawyers were working for his best interest. Me too. Yeah. Number one reason. Yep. Number one reason. Gentlemen's agreement. Well, and I feel Butin was Peg's boy. Right. I no agree. way around it. I can't get past that. And yeah, Sandra's talking about Brendan's lawyers too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That guy's straight up a piece of crap. Oh, it it this case is just Lenny Meow. Yeah. Well, you know, I get you, Doctor Silkman, in a professional laboratory, but unfortunately, we're not in a professional laboratory. We're at the state crime lab. Where well, we're not even we're not even sure they were in the state crime lab because they were also in the. Uh, um, you okay, my the uh, garage. My puppy's having a little seizure. I'll be right back, guys. Yeah, they well, were I'll in the you, I'll Calumet you County what. garage for part of it with the pictures of the car. So maybe the swabs were even done there. Maybe they weren't even in the crime lab. That could be. Well, yeah. Um, you know what really gets me in this case is okay. Let let. Let's look at this case for real. Let's talk about the bones. Problems with the identity. And can we talk about the bones much and get them under the Andy system? No. Why? Because the state is hiding the identity of the bones. Number two, let's talk about the wrath. Let's talk about where's the wrath? Hiding the wrath. Okay, fine. Let's talk about the key. Well, how in the heck... Is there no victim DNA on that key? Period. And you know <laughs> yeah. what? <laughs> There's no patina on the key. Now, as I told you guys, I'm a personal property appraiser. I'm certified by the state of Wisconsin. I can legally go into your home after fire has happened, and I can assess the value of everything you have in your home. And what I do is I sign off an affidavit that states, states the value, and the insurance company, it respects that because I... I know what I'm doing, and they give you that amount. So if I add up your total and say there was $100,000 worth of stuff, then that's what the insurance company is going to give you. And I've been that for many years. We had to learn in the process to become a personal property appraiser, I had to learn how to know the age of something. And metal is extremely easy to know. It gets a patina. Not only, I mean, I could take that brand new key and I could put it through a heck of a lot of crap in the next day or two that made it look used and all tore up. But one thing you can't fake is patina. 
And that's how we know in the antiquity business when something's a fake and when it's not. Because oxidation happens on metal, no matter what kind of metal it is, except for stainless steel. So when you look at the key, it's missing patina which is that golden hue you get over age of, of use. Now, if Teresa's key was supposedly two years old, there is no way the key we are seeing is the key she used. So I think Emma's got it right. I think the state of Wisconsin, we know the state made a key. And so where are Teresa's keys? There would be two. There would be at least two because you see the picture with her standing in front of the RAV. She's got a keychain. You can see two keys poking out of her hands. Well, if you read the CASO, they collect a set of keys that are marked 2003, right when Teresa Halbach gets her car. So do they actually have the real set of the RAV keys? Maybe they don't matter. Maybe they don't matter because they wouldn't have started that RAV if you get my draft. If you follow me. Oh, yeah. I know, Tony. I know. You're going to have to keep taking your blood pressure medicine to stay in this case. I love you. I want you to stay around for a while. <laughs> yes, Gloria, this case drives me crazy. Tony, we got to lay off the pizza. <laughs> we got fake everything in this case. Slayer's got a great point. <clears throat> so remember, Teresa lost her, her lanyard or whatever, and he's saying, well, wouldn't the lanyard have to be repaired? There was a, such a story from a girlfriend or a friend saying that they had to remake the lanyard. Was it I think with the, duct tape? I think the sister was supposed to have gotten her the lanyard after that, though. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm glad you because shared Because she that. always lost her key. Okay. Let's talk about a staged event. Do you, let's, let's do a voting system, okay? I want to try to narrow down where everybody's sitting on mm -hmm. this case. Um, we're running about a half an hour away from the end. Okay. And... Um, might want to ask everybody if they have any suggestions about what they might want to know about for next week. Ah, good point. Okay, before we go there, I want to do a vote. Okay? So, um, how many of you feel, do a thumbs up if you agree with my statement or a thumbs down if you disagree. I'm just going to make a statement and then you can thumbs up it or you can agree with a thumbs up. You can thumbs down it if you disagree. The RAV4 that the state of Wisconsin has is Teresa Halbach's original RAV. So what I'm saying is the state of Wisconsin has a RAV4. I'm saying it is Teresa Halbach's RAV4. If you agree with the statement, show me a thumbs up. If you disagree, then you do a thumbs down. So I've got one thumbs down. Two. I'm going to let you guys vote, and we're going to keep track of some questions here real quick. Ooh, that's white and bright. Mm -hmm. Dang, it's bright. We're going to get rid of that. So that's so four. Right Five thumbs down. Okay. I'm going to write the question real quick. I'm not doing so good typing. <laughs> Okay, Too much working at the job makes Ducky a tired girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. One, two, three, um, four, five, six, 
seven. Okay, seven, say this is a false statement, that that is not her rav. Eight if you're counting me. Okay, eight. All right, nine. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus BB's nine. It's here, but stage. Okay. So we have nine total on thumbs down. Now let's count our thumbs up. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So we have five. So it's basically two to one is what it works out to be. All right. That was our first question. So that's the rev. All right. Now, second question. It's not even a question and statement. Well, I'll put it. Just got another thumbs down. Okay, I can change it to 10 real quick. That way we get a true... Uh, so, yeah. Hmm. Let me get back in there. Oops. Okay. Let's get this one on the board so that we know where the cutoff is for the um okay you guys here's the second statement we're gonna do two or three of these maybe even four <clears throat> so if you agree with the statement that i wrote then underneath it so that we can count it emma go ahead and redo yours please or just yes or no or true or false actually true or false would even be better um that's the statement and now I need you guys to vote. So you can either put true, you agree with the statement, or false, you disagree with the statement. Okay. Some people do believe they're Carmen's bones or they're somebody else's bones. Oh, yeah, here come the votes. Oof. Sorry, you can't read it, Linda? Okay, let me read it to you. The bones that are being held by the Hallbox are Teresa's bones. That's the statement. And you can do yes, no, true, false, thumb up, or thumb down. We'll interpret it. You're very welcome. Okay, is that all the voting, you guys? Uh, you know where I stand on this one. <laughs> well, you're still going to have to say it when we count. We'll add one on to whatever you want. Well. <laughs> How'd I guess? Yeah. Okay, we got a good result here. We'll start counting. We'll start counting. Okay, we're going to try to get the false ones. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten faults at this point, and uh, we'll put that on there. Now let's go back and count the people that agree that that is a true statement, which appears to be a minority, but they could be right because we don't have the bones to test. Emma's one, Tony is two. Emma, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you two are a minority right now. I'm sorry to tell you. Okay. Let's talk about this. The key that was found mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. Colborn and Link was, or I should say, hmm,
Okay, I'll, I'll paste the statement and then I'll read it as well. So this is a statement and you can choose to do true or false again, okay? So the statement is, the key that was found by Colburn and Link was tampered with DNA-wise and was planted. So now we'll vote on this. <laughs> yes, yes, Slayer, the key that was brought by Colburn and Link. That's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's a good one. That's a good way to put it. Okay, we'll keep letting everybody vote. I'm going to get the next one ready while we're waiting on the voting to come in. <laughs> super true. You want to supersize your vote, Zelma? <laughs> Uh, Tony says true times 36 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> okay, now we're going to we're going to switch up the next question will not be true or false. It's actually going to give you multiple choice. And uh, are we counting on the other one or are we just... Yep, I'm through? just letting it go for a minute. Okay, well, I believe it was both tampered with and planted. Well, first they had to make the key. Well, and then they had to smear his DNA, rub his toothbrush on it. And then they had to drop it down by his house shoes. Okay, let's go count. All right, guys. Let's see. How many truths to this are there? Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, seventeen people. Eighteen. Me. Eighteen people. And I'm not even voting on any of this because I'm writing the questions. So, yeah. Do we have anybody that thinks that's a false statement? <laughs> it's okay to say so. Yep, because it's absolutely your point of view and we respect it. Okay, so we have zero on that. Hmm. That's quite telling. Okay, now here is the next question. And I'll read it for those that can't uh, uh, read it. Eh, it won't let me type. Okay, there we go. Do you hear my whine? Yeah. So you get multiple choice. Um, Stephen's blood in the rat is planted at A, the crime lab, B, at the Avery salvage yard, C, not his blood, or D, before the rat was put on the Avery salvage yard. I'm just curious how many people are going to say what. It's a little bit more difficult because it is multiple choice. Baby, what's your vote? Um, crime lab. Okay. So Phoebe's one at the crime lab. One, two, three, four, five B's so far. Four, five, six, seven. Whew. We're going to let that go for a little bit. And while you guys are answering, 
we'll get our next question up. And I can't help but remember that somebody did have access to his blood prior to all of this. How good that blood was, I don't know. <clears throat> Okay, let's go do a count real quick. Oh my gosh, Maya, breathe. She's snoring so loud. Okay, B's. Okay, let's look for A's first. I've got BB's, and then Linda's got one, and then Dr. Silkman said crime lab. So that's three at the crime lab. Now, how many B's do we have? A lot. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, let's go do eight. I've removed mine because I really can't decide. Yeah. That's fine. You can be undecided. I am. I'm so undecided. We leave you to your to your question and we'll just work on finding you an answer okay so not his blood is C I've got one um, 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 um. one okay now let's see before the wrap was put do we have any D's we do we've got one okay and we have one D okay all right, now we're going to do another true or false. This is the fifth one we're going to ask. Let me copy it, and then I'll read it. And then we have one more after this, and then we're going to call it good. We'll do a review. And then we're going to take a poll and see what you guys want us to talk about next week. So what you need to do is, this is a true or false. If you agree with the statement, it's either yes, true, or thumbs up. The statement is... The blood in the back of the wrath is Teresa's. Okay. Now, if you disagree, you can do thumbs down, no, or false. <coughs> People are thinking on this one. Okay, I've got one vote so far for... Okay. Definitely overwhelmingly true. <laughs> they picked. This is our last question. Okay, and you know where my vote is. I'm. Uh, I believe it's okay, false. On the blood in the back of the rev is Teresa's. Yeah, I. I don't think so. I believe it's Carmen's. Okay, so then we've got one false. Let's go ahead and count the false statements. Then mine too. Okay, so two there. I'm sorry, Emma. I love you. Thanks for staying awake for us. Three with Paula. Wait, wait. You guys are saying false, right? False, yeah. Okay, so it's I need not to false. Teresa. Two. And then three is Slayer Rocks. And Mary's not sure. So we have three total. Okay, so we've got three faults. All right. There might have been one thumbs down somewhere, too. Okay. There might be one. More. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, I counted 13. I could be off, but the majority is. Oops. Yeah, yeah, definitely yep. overwhelming majority. Okay. Here comes a big one, you guys. 
This is the last one. This is the question. Let's see if I copied it. Yes. Okay. Again, this one is true or false. I'm just kind of curious. I think it'll be a good understanding of how people feel after all the research they've done and, you know, just to get an impression. Hmm? Slayer Rock and me are boarding buddies. <laughs> Tony, you're saying no question, it's true? That's a no question, Teresa's done. Yeah. Yeah. Toast, as he would say. <laughs> I'm with Mary. I agree with you, Mary. I'm not 100% sure on any of that. <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead and start our count. We're looking for trues. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got six that say it's true. Um, false is one. Oh, we I'm, can I'm a false. We'll go seven. We got another vote from Sandra. Okay, so. Um, false is one with BB, two with Selma, Linda's three, Gloria four, Slayer Rock five, Sammy is six. Okay, so we have six. So, ooh, it's basically down the middle. And there. you got one more true down here. I did, get, uh, I did grab that. Okay, Sandra's. All right. Yep, I got Sandra's. Okay, you guys, let's do a little review here. So, if we went, if we were the jury, okay, this is what we, this is where we would sit. The RAV that the state of Wisconsin has is Teresa Halbach's real RAV4. The, um, Count is in, and false wins by over by half. So according to half of us, over half of us, the majority, 10 to 5, um, say that the RAV that the state has is not Teresa's real RAV4. The bones that are being held by the hall box are Teresa's bones. Only two people believe that it's Teresa's bones. The rest of us do not believe it's Teresa's bones. So by far, the majority do not believe that's Teresa's real wrath, and by far, they do not believe that that's Teresa's bones that the all box have. The key that was found by Colburn and Link um, was tampered with DNA and was planted. 18 feel that's true. So that means that the majority believes that the key was planted, that the bones aren't Teresa's, and that the state doesn't have the right wrath. Stephen's blood in the RAV is planted at the crime lab, the Avery salvage yard. It's not his blood or before the RAV was put on the salvage yard. By far, majority says that it was planted in um, when it was at Avery salvage yard. Um, and number five, the blood in the back of the RAV is Teresa's. Thirteen do believe that that is true. And there are three people that do not believe it is hers. So I have a question for all of us that are saying, well, yeah, that's Teresa's blood in the back of the RAV. Um, how is it that 13 of you believe that's Teresa's real blood, but yet that doesn't leave me enough for, I've only got five that's saying that that's her real RAV. You feel me? So what I'm saying is, if that's really Teresa's blood, you guys explain to me how you think Teresa's blood got into a fake RAV. Okay. Um, Teresa is for sure the victim that has been murdered. We have seven people that believe it's true and we have six people that believe it is false. So with that, you guys, I want to thank you for joining us and um, give us an idea. 
we're get, we've got about nine minutes before we do a hard close for the night. Um, as much fun and as much work as we got done the other night, when I have to get up and go to the work the next morning, oh, I get so sleepy. <laughs> so we're going to try to close this off at nine. And if you want to join us at the puddle, you can. That's just through Discord. But um, we were told last week that jury would be a great topic. And so we did cover a lot of the jury. Um, and like we kind of will we go over real quick. We had a jury that was predisposed to a huge amount of false news in the media. Lies. So they were being told things that were not truthful. They were being told evidentiary stuff that they should not have known that had nothing to do with the specifics of the case that we were going to be working on. Um, then we have people on the jury that have conflict of interest to be on the jury. We have a guy who um, his son works on the force. He volunteers on the force for Manitowoc County, which is being sued. There's problems with that. Now, for lack of better words, um, and I don't mean this in a stupid way. I mean this as lack of understanding. We have ignorance of the jury. So Kratz played on the ignorance of the jury because DNA was such a mystical, for lack of better words, mystical topic back then. He could fabricate whatever he wanted and he would win. It's like, I think about it like um, when, you, when you talked about DNA in 2005, that was something... A select elite few understood. So they had a pretty good chance of selling that jury any story they wanted on that DNA. And then um, when you look at the jury, not only was that all going on, so we have people that shouldn't be on the jury. We've got the jury being told whatever Kratz wanted, and apparently nobody... I. Uh, did we ever hear of the defense on Stevens' team objecting to the crap that Kratz was saying? Can't we object to lies? Can't we just outright call him <clears throat> out on the spot and be like, uh, I object. That's absolutely bullshit. And or yeah, can I you swear. prove that statement? Can you prove that statement? Um, where'd you get that from when we know that's not true? <laughs> you know? Oh, oh frustration. <laughs> So there you go with the jury. Now, not only all that, we've got Remaker with his partner's husband getting reprimanded because they allowed this person to go in with the jury for three and a half hours when they're actually sequestered and they're supposed to be deciding on a human being's well-being, whether they're going to find him guilty or not. We have people in there and is that not jury tampering? I'm pretty sure that that would have been jury tampering. So no matter what, what we've got to look at that because we can't go back. We can't fix what the jury went through, that they were intimidated, that they were had conflict of it. All we can do now is hope to God that we get a retrial. And if we do, it's to educate the public so that they cannot poison the jury pool on this case again and Denied emma jean i mean emma jenkins is uh <clears throat> made a very good comment about they could have called a mistrial so many times why wasn't it called high five emma <laughs> yeah yeah i called yeah. her emma jean at first <laughs> emma jenkins you nailed it there's your question why wasn't it called uh, thank you, Emma. Night, night, Mary. We love you. Thanks for staying up till all hours of the night with us. Um, Sandra says, Brendan's story was so outrageous. I think it's insulting for our intelligence that they expected anyone to believe it plausible that it ever happened, especially given the complete lack of evidence. All right. <clears throat> okay, you guys. Yeah. Anybody have suggestions for next week that you that we should dig into? And um, everybody's welcome to come to the puddle. Yeah, let me grab that link real quick. If you still are wanting to continue on on chatting uh, chatting on the case, um, we will have open group public chat available. 
I'm grabbing the Discord link. And you use a telephone system basically in there, and you can even speak to us with your voice. Yep. Or, or you could write on the wall if you yeah, need if you're to. Jealous, you uh, jealous if you're if jealous. you're shy, uh, if you're shy, or um, what do you call that? Or Nervous. your or your Nervous. spouse is sleeping Anxious. next to you. Yeah. yeah, or you can't make noise in your house because everybody's sleeping. You can type asleep. in there. I, yeah, you can type and in listen. There. Yeah, absolutely. And I also, think, uh, you have a question up here. Okay. Um, it said, why did they not search her home as thoroughly as AS, ASY? And I wanted oh. to mention that yeah. BB did a whole big thing on that on how many cops yeah. were over at Teresa's. And, it's, on um, with the, it's on with the live about the audio box cell phone. It's yeah. the second well, half of that. And, and I have found where Go check that out is, the videos there, too, because she, there's a lot of information in these videos and the, that the, Ducky the does. Total, the total I got there uh, is actually a little bit conservatively low because I have found a few places where I found other times they were in there that weren't on there. So, Yes, Sandra, it'll be going on. We'll start that in about five minutes minutes which is the group chat over it is live and it is group chat um we've had 25 people on the call it runs real smooth believe it or not Most some of the time. people like to just listen other people like to voice their opinion or ask questions and it's very fun and very addictive to be honest yeah um, we do have a suggestion for next week from cinnabar and she suggests roger randoons uh, He's so strange. Roger Randoons is a gentleman that was reportedly alleged that he admitted that he killed Teresa Halbach when she had a flat tire. So we and could, the documents on that are still sealed, even though he's been dead for more than ten years. So yeah. it would be we would not be able to get any of that information. Um, so oh, some, makes, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm listening. Oh no, please do. I talk. Well, so some much. some laws I've noticed around here have changed when um, there's uh, records, whether they're they have to do with crimes or arrest records or even death. Um, around here, they've changed where it could be 25 years before it becomes public records anymore. Ah. Yeah, that means they're not following the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, well, right. they obviously don't care. It's changing. So, right. you know, um, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Slayer says, how feasible is it that Carmen's blood and bones are the basis of this case? Slayer, I'm going to tell you, I'm with you. I really honestly have looked at this. I do have some information I cannot um, give out at this point that would make it possible that the intimate sample could have come from Carmen. So, if Well, it, sure, any of it could. They, they yeah. did an autopsy. They took tox screens on her. Um, they, they proved that she died of an overdose. So right there, they could have gotten anything they needed right there. There's no way around it. Right. <laughs> so um it is now I hate to say it nine o'clock it is that so, time you guys so it's we'll time for Robert there. Ducky saying yeah and yes before I say that I want to say thank you to all the researchers that worked all week on getting this information about the jury so that's Sammy and BB and Zoe and Tony and everybody um, and Lily. All the work you guys did helped me. I came in from work. I was able to read through everything you guys had, put a little board together and share that. Carmen Botwell okay. is the girl who died on the third in Manitowoc. True. Um, you read that? Yeah. Okay. Letting, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, and then I all want to thank everybody for joining us. I know some of it, like you said, 3 a.m. 
oof, that's that's amazing that you guys stay with us on all these chats and stuff. Thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. Um, and thank you for bringing worldwide awareness for Brendan and Stephen and keeping them safe. And much love to all of you. Okay, it's time. One, two, three. If you if didn't, you didn't do, do the crime, crime, you shouldn't do, the time. do the, the time. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Look forward to Monday night. We're going to have a wonderful double showing of videos from Dr. Silkman. And you're not going to want to miss this, you guys. It is incredible. So I can't wait to share that with you guys. And the work that he put into it is phenomenal. The sources are all there for you. So hope to see you on that. And then uh, next week, we start with the Castle Read again. <laughs> we're nearing the halfway point. I don't know what we're going to do when we reach the halfway point. Maybe celebrate or something. Um, also, the mini mams are still coming out. We're on week seven coming up. We do have some special things I can't tell you now, but we have some amazing surprises coming up for you at the end of next week and the beginning of the following week. So this month is going to be rocking and rolling in this case. A lot of wonderful stuff. For those of you that are not familiar, there is also the Stephen Avery Library, the RD Stephen Avery Library. Let me grab a link to that real quick. I'll just copy it right here. All these links are available for you in the description of all of our videos. So there you are. Love you guys. Have a great night and thank you so much.